uh, I might leave at about five fifty because of that other uh, big meeting. Huh? Okay, sir, no problem. So, uh, so start now. I want to listen to a little bit before I go. Okay, Akshi, can you? Yes. Help? Yes, sir. We will start. Anyway, sir. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the seventeenth meeting of this journal club. The presenter of today's session is Dr. Elvis Martis, and he is going to present a paper on highly accurate protein structure prediction with alpha food. Elvis, sir, you can begin the presentation. Thank you. So, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining. So, we are here to discuss a paper on highly accurate uh, prediction. Protein structure prediction with alpha fold, and this paper had a big news. Uh, still is a big news in, in what is called as how to how do we solve a protein folding problem that given a sequence of protein uh, or an unknown protein for its folds are un, uh, not experimentally validated or found out till date can be resolved and you know give a computational input to what a protein structure would look like. And Google's DeepMind uh, venture we call it as uh, that is fully. Developing their tools, the other thing on alpha fold, uh, sorry, on uh, what is called as artificial intelligence. Previously, they solved a problem, uh, 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 came up with an algorithm called as Alpha Zero and Alpha Go, which were kind of you know the gaming codes, the computer which learned how to play games and uh, challenge to beat the world experts in their own games. This is one of their same uh, on a similar line. They come up with uh, how to predict the protein structure if you just give a protein uh, sequence to it. Okay, and there's a bunch of big authors that, that came up and this was almost uh, two, three years of research because knowing Google has a very large computing facility, so they can do pretty large amount of calculations in very little amount of time. And some of the architecture is not even there in the public domain as far. So the flow presentation is I'm going to introduce a very little bit of what is a protein folding, uh, give you an introduction of what is artificial neural networks. Then I will give you some Terminologies that are used in the paper, which are not generally known to normal, uh, general people, and they're very specific to people working in the area of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And then we'll go on to discuss three key, uh, key points on uh, Alpha Fold 2. Why I call Alpha Fold 2 is because this is the paper of the second second version of this uh, algorithm, uh, which actually broke all the barriers of how much how much accurate a folding method or a protein structure prediction method could go. Previously, AlphaFold 1 was also using for what is called as artificial intelligence, but they were using a different set of algorithms in course, and this is a way different from what it is. So I'm going to give you a glimpse of what AlphaFold 1 was and how different is AlphaFold 2 from AlphaFold 1. Okay, so a protein structure, as we all know, is a primary structure comprises of just a single linear chain uh, or a single sequence of amino acids read from N terminal to C terminal. Okay. And this is the primary information which biology takes in to fold a protein into a native structure, which is what do I mean by native structure is a functionally active conformation. Or if you see theoretically, a sequence can fold into many different many different ways. Okay, and it may happen so during the course of the folding pathway, which we call it as a metastable state, which are which may not be biologically relevant. What is biologically active and relevant is the state which it takes. After folding into a correct state, maybe it's an enzyme which folds into a correct state to give you a catalytic center and that carries all the enzyme mechanisms or it's, it's, it's the channel which, which gives you a fold of a barrel like where you know uh, ions can flow in and out or whatever it's supposed to flow in and out of the system that, that goes on. So when we break the structure of the protein, we get into a primary structure. Based on that, we have what is called as secondary folds, which alpha helix or C. There are various versions of alpha helix. There is a 310 helix. There is a different helix based on how tight it is bound. Okay. Then there is thickest sheets which goes parallel, anti parallel. And there are uh, random coils, we call it as, which have neither of the structures. Okay. And then all of this fold into a particular structure, what we call it as a dirty structure, where all of these alpha helix is beta pleated sheets and the loops that keep the protein, uh, all the regions in, in place. And also, these loops also are the primary reasons why some of the motors are more mobile than the others. Okay. And there's a third part, what is called as a quaternary structure, when two of these folded proteins come together. Like if you see hemoglobin, it is made up of four hemoglobin 
unit. Okay. Uh, the other example would be al uh, protein, uh, protease enzyme, which is made of the same uh, protomer, which is which we call it as homodimer. Okay, differently, and they are functionally active. So some are functionally active, some are only meant for storage purposes, which may not be, which may be functionally active as an independent unit. But this is not the case in case of protease. Protease is, uh, is active as a dimer. So all of this information, what I just spoke about, is encoded in the protein amino acid sequence, which is coming from a DNA sequence after all. So conventionally, how the protein structure algorithm would take is to take all of this information about a protein and the amino acid sequence is stored in a Uniprod database that is Universal Protein Data Bank or database. Okay. Now there are algorithms which came up, looked up at what was solved in the experimental uh, exper experimentally using NMR, x crystallography, and now cryo-electron microscopy. And they understood what is the relationship between a, a length of the sequence that is more tend to be an alpha helix or a beta sheet or a no structure or a random point. Okay. And then they came with uh, prediction structure. If you give you a sequence, they'll tell you at least what every length of protein is supposed to, which, which secondary structure every uh, length of protein is supposed to take. Okay. And based on this information, there are other tools that came in, what is called as threading or homology modeling or abinitio based method, which took homologous proteins which are similar, which have sequence levels similar or identical to these, these lengths. And when they were solved experimentally, so we would fold as unknown sequence into those experimental codes and that is called a thread, which was supported by if the prediction servers also mapped that the a pair of sequence, which was a predicted alpha helix, also folded upon into alpha helix from the tensor structure. This was the conventional method of how we used to uh, solve protein structures that had a lot of reliance on homologous protein. So if you have a protein structure, when there was no homologous protein available, then you were in a big, great problem. We did not know how to solve it. Abinitio methods were one of the methods which broke down the protein sequences, folded them into local structures, and then tried to you know make into a global structure. But this was sometimes give it a very meaningless structure. Okay, and Abinitio structures that is free modeling, uh, template free modeling structures, were a class of methods that uh, were only good at protein sequence, uh, protein length of 100 amino acids and less to be at least uh, some worth of accuracy. But for larger proteins, like if you're looking at some large G-protein coupled receptors, they completely had, I mean, you know, they were uh, off by a large margin. Whereas uh, template uh, modeling were uh, trying to at least find some good structures. But all of these methods consistently failed in predicting how, how well these side chains are placed. Because if you're looking at proteins that, uh, let's say it's a heme protein, which the side chains are oriented such that the porphyrin ring of the heme should be kept. If you're folding a Structure with the sequence information holds no information about what subset goes in or what what is a kind of a, a you know a cofactor goes in or, or what kind of metal that is bind. This it doesn't have this kind of information. Okay, so all of these methods could not predict the side chains of all these proteins very correctly. They were completely off. But since you got a fold or the backbone geometry of the protein correct, many software then developed so that they could predict what is called as the side chain rotamer library that came up that what was observed in the experiment, we could predict knowing what the backbone structure is and we could kind of predict the side chain, side chain structure. And so you use the multiple programs to come up to a very decent amount of structure that you could use in your, in your research ahead. Now, protein structure determination, we have two class of methods. One is experimental. Okay, we have X-ray crystallography, which has been the, the kind of a gold standard giving you very, very accurate structures to the level that you can actually uh, you know, point out the exact XYZ coordinates or 3D coordinates of carbon, nitrogen, and so on and so forth. Okay? The next was NMR. NMR gave you, uh, based on the placement of protons, the placement of carbons and protons, the placement of carbon, protons, and nitrogen, a different different NMR sequence, I got, uh, sequence uh, pulse sequences came up, which you can solve the, solve the protein structures by placing constraints. Oui. To share it, try and share it. Share. Yeah, there is somebody who's unmuted. Actually, can you unmute them? Yes, actually, you can ask the question. No, uh, for some compounds, we can't really obtain their uh, crystals, right? So, what in that case? Oh, yeah, there are many examples. So, if so, in X ray crystallography, there are two things one, the protein cannot give you a good enough crystal. 
okay then it's useless you cannot do an x-ray crystallography the other options you are left with is nmr and cryo electron microscopy the second problem with the x-ray is you get a nice crystal structure but the diffraction pattern is useless so if the diffraction pattern is useless you still cannot use that crystal structure to deduce any of the structure so you are either using nmr or cryo electron microscopy cryo electron microscopy has given you a lot of promise for these kind of structures for example, this is generally faced problems when you are looking for G-protein coupled receptors whose structure is by the virtue of their embedding in the bilayer membrane. And uh, you cannot actually use bilayer membrane in, in X-ray crystallography. You have to use some different kind of uh, surfactants and all those things to hold that you know, structure. For those, for those all uh, problems, cryo-electron microscopy has given much, much promising results. Even NMR does not, I think, uh, is not very useful for methods when you see protein coupled receptors. So, Sakshi, was it any clear? Yes, sir. I I'll try to be more specific the next day. Okay. Okay. So, all of these methods, what I do, experimental methods, they require a lot of uh, mall biology background work. So, you have to express the protein, you have to crystallize the protein. Crystallization is, is like every time it's a new protein, it's a new crystallization condition, which we do not know prior to starting the experiment. So we have to do several trials and some of the crystals do appear after a month of, you know, keeping them in an um, undisturbed position. So all of this takes a lot of time, sometimes from anywhere between six months to maybe a couple of years until you get a full structure. So if you, if you go back in time when the ribosome structure was solved, it took many, many years, I think a decade or more years when the structure was solved, you know, in small, small patches and entire structure is now known for which uh, there was a Nobel Prize for that, and they use X-ray crystallography. All of this, what I want to say is a time-consuming, expensive process, and if you do not have access to any of these facilities, then you are just helpless. You cannot, you cannot work with protein structure. The other way is to do computationally. So if you know a pair of sequence, and you know a template structure, template structure means that target what you want to predict is homologous to it, so you believe that they would attain a similar fold, in their life, so you can map this sequence wise, and the sequence is mapped to three structures. But you see, there are sometimes gaps, and these gaps, which don't align correctly, give rise to inaccuracy. Okay, if you have a very nice folded, uh, very nice similar structure or identical structure, then you believe that it is going to fold similarly. But the inaccuracies come from the gaps what we have, even though we claim that we have loop modeling algorithms or some molecular mechanics post field which are able to you know, correct these inaccuracies, but this is not in a very, uh, uh, very, very accurate manner. So these are inexpensive, very fast. You can do entire protein sequence to structure within a day's time or a couple of hours, okay? But they're highly inaccurate, not accurate. I mean, inaccurate related to these methods, but you know the expense versus inexpense, accurate versus inaccurate. So you have to make a judgment call. Most of us, the judgment call will be whether do we have access to this to this facility. So most, and these facilities are uh, inexpensive in the sense there are free tools available, okay, which you can just submit the sequence on the web server and within a couple of hours or sometimes within a couple of minutes, you get the folded structure. And then you do all these refinements and then use the structure uh, for further. Okay, so now to the protein folding problem. Why are we failing in to understand, if you know the sequence of the protein, why are we failing in to determine the native structure or the active transformation, okay? So Christopher Anselton, who also won the Nobel Prize for the same thing, he said, the primary structure of the protein, its linear amino acid sequence determines the native structure. It's so simple as that, okay? Because biology doesn't take any more information than the protein sequence. But how does biology take milliseconds to microseconds to fold a protein into an active state and transport it to place where it's supposed to be? Whereas we humans with enormous access to computers and experiments, we are unable to solve that problem. So for that answer came up with Levinson's paradox. A very large number of degrees of freedom in an unfolded polypeptide chain leads to an astronomical number of possible conformations. The number is approximately 10 to the power 300. Now, if you use a very systematic method of changing every degree of freedom slowly, slowly, slowly until you get the nice structure, the amount of time that would require to use Hold a very small amount of a very decent sized protein would be larger than the 
age of the universe. So even if it was started four billion years ago, then the universe just began. Uh, I think yeah, or uh, thirteen million years ago. You wouldn't have still solved the structure that you started then. So this is the problem. So many degrees of freedom and. that degrees of freedom we do not have any prior knowledge of how they should fold and how they should fold so they can we can apply some kind of a restraint or a constraint or biases that will reduce the number of degrees of freedom okay now this is exactly the problem what alpha fold challenge even if we don't know directly what are the constraints but now we have so much biological information from the sequence data from the evolutionary data of how the proteins evolved over time how the structures look like in a given sequence all this information where the alpha fold was able to reduce the degrees of freedom and they were able to come up with a structure a correctly folded structure or i would say not a correctly but a relatively accurately correct uh, accurately folded protein in a matter of week if not if not year okay so here it is we, this is an unfolded protein if you if i believe that this is a free energy landscape so if you start here on the upper of the conical which is completely unfolded there are so many local minima where it can get trapped okay remember the goal is to come here the final folded structure is one of the low low energy structure which has to come here but the challenge is this we have no idea of how it looks when you start from here we have no idea how this looks so imagine yourself going on a hill top and from there you want to descend down but there are two conditions one it is dark second it is foggy so you don't know the way down so you have to you know kind of calculate your way down and the way to do this is by dropping into small small pockets what we call it as local minimum okay and sometimes you descend very fast because the steep is fast the nearest valley and sometimes you get trapped here because you came up from a high energy state to drop into a low energy state and then you felt that you were at the you know uh, at the uh, place where you need to be but that's not the case in in computational chemistry we never actually know whether we are at the global minimum we always land up at one of these and believe that at least structurally everything is not distorted so it starts here on the left it folds here it has to sample so many things now this this simulation that is happening here is of so many so many million steps in time and it ultimately leads now this is a very hypothetical condition that i'm showing you to that it folds very Very easily starting from one position here. Imagine that it started and went here. It would take so many, so much time to come here. So the problem is, we have so much degrees of freedom and no way to tell which should be neglected and which should be focused. Okay. The second concept is artificial intelligence. Now, the intelligence word itself comes from how we learn things, how fast we learn things, how much we learn things, and what is the mechanism of how we learn things. So all of us learn. how to talk how to walk how to run how to jump how to li listen was inherent but how to understand a language how to speak a language write a language and all of in the school we did a lot of mistakes and we did a mistakes we learned from the mistakes and we did not repeat sometimes we did repeat mistakes but most of the times we learned from the mistake that this is not how an apple is written this is not how an orange is written o looks very different from a q u looks very different from a v w looks different from an a so all of this we learned by writing or what is called as by trial and error okay this is how everybody learns this is how a biological and the learning process that happens is to the exon now these are the exons and dendrites which make connections with the other and in the middle you have some connections made and some connections not made in the process some areas in the brain get activated some areas in the brain don't get activated and a specific areas are you know kind of brain is a network of this thing so imagine that a particular learning a language skill activates a particular set of network a num numeral uh, 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 um, a music skill or a music skill or uh, you know a walking skill or a running skill or a jumping skill will activate different network now what i mean by this is it makes certain connection okay certain specific connection in the brain so that you learn now you're walking you're talking you're listening you're you're drinking or you're eating okay a similar kind of model was developed what is called as perceptron model where your input model that what you see per se is understood into a kind of a, an initially it was a black box okay and the weighting was synonymous to activating a network or not activating a network okay okay and and in in neurons we know that 
it has it has an all or none principle either either activated or not activated but mathematically what i can do is i can partially weight them so that a network is partially activated and partially not activated so if if i if i give an activation full activation as a number 1 no activation as zero i can have an intermediate state of 0.5 where the network is half activated and half not that is called as weighting and this is how it is come weighting so every input is associated with the layer in the middle which was initially in 1969 was called a black box layer it's connected to the output and nobody really understood how it was they only adjusted the weights randomly so that the result here was accurate and accurate and accurate so the information you fed in this was called a feed forward mechanism and the error what was the expected error what was the expected result and the error was fed back to the network so that the weights could be corrected that is this is the learning phase okay and then it improved over time and at one point what happened was it stopped improving okay that you can assume that convergence has attained okay there is no further improvement and learning would stop and in later term we learned that something it was over learning this is called as an over learning problem as as over fitting problem so if you fill in more information than desired you get a very nicely looking model but which is over fit okay so it could also over uh, over learn but in 1969 the term over learning was not very famous because the data was sparse So now, as I was already telling you, feed forward mechanism will give you input layers. There are many layers. Now that was just one layer. There are several layers in this case. We call that hidden units one, two, and so on and so forth. So if you if you're you looking at the deep learning model, this hidden layers could go in 32, 64, and so on and so forth. Okay. So each input layer is connected to all the hidden layers. Okay, first hidden layer, and they are weighted to each other. Okay, the weighting decides how much this input and this will be important to this input, this input and this input. Okay, and this is what is the trick of the learning process. Okay, what is back propagated is once you reach here, you get an output, but you have an expected output. Okay, when you're training the model, like for instance, uh, the famous uh, machine learning, uh, what they give us example of cat and a dog problem. So you show a million cat images, you show a million dog images. Okay, so the the new network learn tries to understand what a cat looks like when a dog looks like. So it has a million data points, two million data points of cats and dogs. Then you give another image, which I know it is a cat, but that image was not given to the structure. So learning from that, it understands that whether it could be classified as a cat or a dog. Okay, so every time it learns something, while in the learning phase, it could have classified a dog for a cat, but then it went back and said, oh, that was a cat, so I need to correct something went wrong here. so all the errors were back propagated in okay so so they can identify where the error came from and that accordingly the weight was adjusted or readjusted several times until it predicted gave you the correct information this is this is what a neural network artificial neural network works like okay so this is a small kind of you know a video representation of how it's activated connected and an output is given so every network here in green is activated okay the connections are shown how it goes okay not everything is activated at once the green ones are activated the dark ones say they are heavily weighted the light ones say they are less weighted and then if you see here there's a white light green going up so there's a weight given to every node so if that that input or what you call it as an activation function the activation function actually tells you at what level i should be activating the connection of the node if that threshold is not reached it is set to zero and it is not activated okay so if you see in spite of having a connection it is not activated but whether this and these are activated so the weight was so less that it did not felt prudent that this was a necessary one and only activated the other part so at the end based on which neurons are struck on and off you get a classification classification could be cat dog and a man or Number one, two, three, or whatever is the classification—a drug-like molecule or a non-drug-like molecule. Okay, all of these—the protein structure, the DNA structure, and RNA structure—all are basically chemicals. What makes DNA? DNA. What makes RNA? RNA. So you can have these three class models. Okay. So again, I'm going to reiterate on this. This now, what was unknown as a positron model was given a function. Now all of these functions are weighted and are linear combinations, and this is the error. and this is the actually activation function now 
if this sum does not come to a, a threshold value of this okay it will not be activated like you still have some let's say uh, let's say i put an activation function that the threshold should be 0.5 okay if the v value is less than 0.5 this neuron, this node does not get activated. Like this node in the previous did not get activated because it did not cross a level of threshold. But then others did if they cross a threshold. This this ensures that you are saving on time of not looking at neurons which are you know making very very little contribution. Okay. So deep learning, you add much more layers. Okay. So you are breaking down information to every small bit of possible. So if it's an image, if you want to do, and what is called as an image learning, if you want to identify between a cat and a dog. So you know, images are made of pixels, and every pixel is a small information. It's with maybe given a, a color code. If you see the red, green, blue color code, so every will have a particular code to it. So the code will tell how, what is the combination of that bit, okay? How dark it is, how low. But this, if you see, if I show you a cat and a dog image, the dog or cat will be in the center and the rest of the image outside will make no sense because it's a background. And that background information has nothing to do with your classification model. So it will identify which pixels are actually more important, okay? And which pixels are just a background structure. And background will be filtered off and these are these nodes which actually are not lit up because they don't cross the particular threshold and that pixel doesn't make up to what is important to show uh, in a small jigsaw puzzle that makes a cat or a dog, okay? And this information is fed in many, 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 many layers that is we call it as deep learning neural networks. Okay, now back to the paper. So we have important terminologies like when we, when we, and these are not only important terminologies that we look at uh, this particular paper, but if you're working in a protein structure prediction, we will come across these terms more often like local distance difference test. So it will tell you the local interactions, how the local interactions in a reference structure that comes out in a protein model. So if you have a model which you have used to build your structure, there will be a set of interactions between amino acids inside. How much have you conserved them? If you have conserved them as is, then you have very good, uh, 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 you know, very less difference, okay? Then a model is good. If you have a very large difference, that means the model is not very good. How they do that is they have a predefined uh, kind of a threshold that is to take a residue, okay, and you take what is called as a sphere, what is called as an incre inclusive radius, which you exclude yourself, that the residue atoms are excluded from themselves, you are going to measure the distance of all other residues, and that is similarly that is done for the reference structure. If that for residue A matches with the residue B, with the, with the you know, uh, kind of a, a be, uh, allowed variation, then you see the structure predictions are correct. So large variations give very large differences, small variations with very small scores. This was fine-tuned to take only C alpha atoms. Since we're looking at protein structures, they looked at only C alpha atoms. Now these atoms, what I'm talking about, were taken for all of the structures. In this case, only C alpha atoms are taken. Okay? And when you do that, this becomes specific to C alpha local distance differences. We call it CLDDT and LDDT C alpha. And a global distance test. Now, this is very local because they're looking at atom wise or residue wise, or C, you know, a particular residue wise. When you want to compare two structures as a whole, two protein structures as a whole, okay, then what you do is this global distance test. You take the sequence, take the sequ uh, identical sequence of the protein, and you take the tertiary structure, you overlap them and try to fit them as good as possible. And whatever differences that remain is given as GDP. So, this is given a score of 0 to 100. 100 means you have a 100% match. Zero means it's completely random structure, okay? So this you can scale down from zero to one, okay? Zero means completely uh, uh, nonsense or uncomparable structure. 100 means you're comparing same thing with itself. And any value above 0.5, it's considered good any value below 0.5 is completed that it's a random sequence. If any any result would have occurred. Like you could have flip a, uh, flipped a coin and said what the result should be, okay? So expect that result to be 0.1. And alpha fold had both of this at more than 93% of the folded structures, which I will tell you in the later slide. And and why they were called, uh, why they made a news, because all of the servers that were taking part in this uh, competition called as CAP, okay, they could only attain so far a score of 60%. And Alpha Fold had attained a score of 93% in just a matter of two years. That's the reason why this, this algorithm 
made a big news in the beginning. Okay, TM score is again some version or uh, a different version of the global distance, uh, global distance uh, test, which has a similarity between two structures. Higher similarity is the higher score. Uh, MSA one terminology would have uh, come up in the paper is multiple sequence alignment. So we take two sequences and try to align them one or the other based on based on a, uh, a matrix substitution matrix which tells you what amino acid uh, uh, sorry it tells you with if it's an alanine so if an alanine there can be an alanine uh, alanine which can take the next uh, you no know, can be aligned under an alanine but if it's a phenyl alanine or as other amino acid, what is the probability that alanine can substitute to a phenyl alanine if the probability is high this which is given a substitution matrix so which is which is built on known uh, uh, no known mutation known in the structure so what is the probability of alanine mutating to phenylalanine or alanine mutating to glycine this probability is uh, looked up in the protein data bank or what is already known in the structure and the probability is fixed so each probability if you make a highly probable change or uh, align align change then you are scoring very high so making a very improbable change okay for instance an alanine going to alpha uh, proline okay that could be scored very low and your overall alignment score will come down so the alignment score tells you how these two sequences are evolutionary linked okay if they are close together okay then they should have a very high score in their alignment score <coughs> the critical assessment cas the cas is the competition i was talking about there are now there are very several uh, way uh, you know methods that have come up with with which claim that we can given the sequence will will predict the tertiary structure and to do that uh, uh, there is a some benchmarking or some testing algorithm that how how this how this algorithm are able to test uh, uh, you know uh, how good this algorithms are able to hold a structure so cast are held finally that is every two years so what they do is cast is a group of people who have come up and say before when uh, crystallographers or structural biologists saw a protein structure before that is released to public these guys go to them and say you give us a structure don't read to the people and just tell us the sequence the sequence okay is given to these, these people who claim to be solving the structure or you know and this have to come up with a tertiary structure only the cast group knows what the structure is and when the results are submitted every result is checked to the real structure which already we have and how good or bad the predict, uh, uh, prediction server is is dependent upon these two scores okay these two the, the entire cast will be ranked will rank an algorithm based on these two scores okay the second mechanism what is attention mechanism now in neural networks how we learn things is by paying attention to small small details and we we changed you know small small details while we learn so in a learning process okay we look at certain things where we made mistakes and that is what is called as attention we did not Uh, every time we made made a mistake, we did not start from scratch one. We started from where we made an error. So this kind of attention mechanism is also uh, relatively new to machine learning, which focuses on parts of the training algorithm which needs more attention or which needs more tune tune or which is more relevant to the current output. Okay. Now this was transformed into transformers. That is another deep learning model which is based on the attention. So. So, uh, so uh, if in in natural pro language processing, when we, what we give is the is a sentence, okay, and it understands what could be the next. If I give you a word, what could be the next word? Or if I give you a set of string of words, the algorithm will predict what could be the next word. Now, giving sentences is too complex, okay. So what what this transformer does is it holds on or it grabs on to attention attention terms like, um, for instance. I I come from Karnataka, so I speak Kannada. So what is the key word? This the Karnataka and Kannada. Okay. If I understand the if I present the context by holding on to two words, I can you know be a little carefree about the other words. I am. It's okay. I am. Uh, I am is not relevant to where. So Karnataka and Kannada. So when you are focusing on these attention, these are what transformers are trying to do. They are grabbing the context of a sentence. Okay. and they are trying to make prediction so to understand the context you can make better prediction so you are attend you are focusing attention on a particular context so you do not have to look at the entire string of sentences but you can focus on the key words or attention specific words okay so here we are on alpha fold alpha fold 1 took two 
quick information. One is the protein sequence data. What is the MSA embedding, what we call that. If I know the evolutionary relationship of a protein sequence is one another, all that is known till date, okay? I can group the multiple sequence pro uh, multiple by using a multiple sequence alignment to so specific protein classes. That is how our protein families and foldings are decided, okay? And second, what we use is what is called as a distance matrix. So taking the 3D structure from the protein data bank and the sequence, I can know that when, when a protein folds in a particular structure, which two atoms should come close together, which two residues come, should come close together, and what is the relationship of that residue with every other residue in terms of distance. Now, once I know the input sequence, I can place it into correct way of which this protein sequence belongs to according to the multiple sequence alignment. And from the protein data bank structure or the tertiary structure, I can get the predicted pairwise distances, okay, which is already fed into the data. And using this classification and this pairwise data, the alpha fold was able to put that information into structure of this sequence fold into a particular way based on the distances of residues with each other and come up with a 3D structure. Now, the problem here was when you are looking at pairwise structures, what they took, what they initially used was convolution neural network, which looks at local structures first. And while doing looking at local structures, what gets missed is sometimes in the folding pathways, there is also an influence of long-range interaction, which this does not take into consideration. Or, or I would rather put it this way, it you know, does not accurately put this into consideration. So there were large inaccuracies in alpha fold one, okay? Which in alpha fold two, they completely did away with the convolutional neural network, okay? And they came up with what is called as attention-based mechanism, which I just explained, and use transformers to completely understand how, how we can use small, small local, as well as global at the same time, and refine them. While you, while you were predicting the structure, every time you made a structure, you sent that back, this information was sent back. Okay, let me put it here, okay? This is the same piece of information. What was new was the lower format. Lower format is a 48 block. Every block had a specific role to play, okay? That took information of multiple sequence representations, okay? And the pairwise representation, the distance, the atomic distances between the residues, okay? And the advantage of taking atomic distance matrices, it is independent of how you're holding the structure. That is the rotation and the translation, okay? This don't change over which frame. If you're looking at the protein from north to south or south to, south to north or east to west, it doesn't change because it is very specific to that. And, you know, and this is the reason why, you know, we understand that rotation and transition motion do not change the energy, but just look, change the frame of how you're looking at, okay? This was an advantage. So it didn't matter which way you're looking at the protein, this pair representations will never change, okay? Now, once you feed this information to this EVO blocker, it would do transformation. I will uh, speak about that in the next slide. And it will come up with a new set of representations that were fed to a structure module, okay? Which was eight blocks, which did eight operations, I would say, and this would do 48 operations, okay? And came up with a tertiary structure. Now, based on that, and your scoring, there was a TM scoring algorithm, which I already spoke about, which identify which are the regions where high confidence and low confidence and this was fed in back again so this all this information was updated here the evo former updated looking at where the errors were that is how the network learns a new set of response and again and iteratively at least they uh, in this case they required at least three times in some cases and some cases only one and I will tell you which would require how many recycle uh, times, okay? And then you came up with very, very highly accurate stuff. Now let's get in depth with what is an EO form. Now, if you look at the multiple sequence alignment, there are two components you see. If you see the rows and the columns, the columns actually tell you, if I have an amino acid, uh, let's say alanine, okay? How many times alanine has occurred or how many times amino acids of a very, uh, acceptable move, you know, according to what is acceptable as that. That is, that is a column-wise potential, okay? And a row-wise, if you give a sequence, compared to your sequence, in our MSA representation, where you land, which, which are the set of protein sequences, which are closest to you, okay? And then, all of this is fed into what is called as a transition, which sums up what is called as element-wise, that is row-wise, 
and you have a product map. Now that information is coupled with what is called a pair wise. The pair wise representation is coming from the protein data bank. Okay, the protein data bank is has all the folded structures, so you know if you take all the 170,000 atoms, that is 170,000 protein atoms, and if you take them uniquely, uh, actually the protein data bank has almost about a million entries, but not all of them are unique. So the unique entries are about uh, 170,000. Yeah, 170,000 unique entries that you take in and you calculate the pairwise representation of, of all the folded possible structures and that information is fed. Now, <clears throat> sorry. Now in the next slide, I'm going to tell you what is this triangle updating uh, and all these things. And this, after all this transformation, you get a new set of pair representation, okay, for your, for your particular. Now, this is all, all that has learned, okay, and this information, the MSA, that is multiple sequence alignment representation that the model has learned and okay, this information is fed in. Sometimes this information flows this way. So pairwise representation is also fed into this way to understand where the sequence lands and what the pairwise expected pairwise representation should be. And it is also given, or, uh, also given as what the protein structures should look like or, uh, or individual amino acids should look like in class of business neighbor. So the output, what we expect from here is uh, a distance criteria, on torsion angle criteria, a bond angle criteria, and all those things, okay? This is fed in, and what is this actually? So if, if I have an I and J are two atoms, now these are all graph space theory, so a, where you are edges, and nothing but your amino acids and your nodes, okay? Other, other relationships or the distance relationships. So if you are connected to the third atom, okay? So what is the relationship? So that is, governed by what is called as a tri uh, triangle inequality theory. So what you say is, what the theory says is, is, if I add this and this, so this distance, the third third vertex, the third distance, is always less than the sum or at least equal to. It cannot be greater than this. Okay? So based on that rule, you are trying to place atoms or residues in place now. And that is governed by this pairwise potential. Now you start to form what is called as Residue I, what is the relationship of residue I? Uh, I, I would put it more specifically, the spatial relationship of residue I to J, okay, I to K, and that you go on for every atom. Then you do upgrade, you, you, you can add a new K, or you add in place K, based on what criteria it is fulfilling, okay? It is going on adding and adding and making adjustments. At the same time, it makes that all the mathematical geometry or Euclidean distance rules are all followed. Okay. At this time, what you have what is called as the 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 the, uh, the relative positioning of every atom uh, or every residue in here. Okay. So this is now fed in what is called as a structure module. The structure module is actually where your protein is born. Okay. Now the important part is the uh, is the invariant and point attention. Now we have to start with somewhere. Now I have information about the sequence. I have information about pairwise potential. But where do I start? So the, what they start is what we call it as a black box, uh, uh, a black box prediction. So initially you place all the residues and set their coordinates to origin zero. Okay, everything is set to zero. You can see that they are on one another. Okay. And based on now, you are feeding in information from pairwise potential, so they start moving apart and making forming a kind of a local structure, okay, based on this distance criteria. What we call it now, what you get is a backbone framework, okay, and based on the backbone framework, we know exactly how a backbone forms, okay. We know because of Ramachandran's so the uh, Ramachandran's plot. We know exactly how the backbones has to be placed, what is the C phi angle. We know that part, okay? But initially, we don't make that connection. We just keep them relatively as they are residues which are, <coughs> sorry, which are to make a particular backbone structure, okay? And then after that, it is fed in. What are chi angles are? The angles that the side chains make. The phi and psi angles are what comes from the backbone. The chi angles are coming from side chains. So, so if you see alanine, alanine has no chi angle, but isoleucine has three to four chi angles. Okay, glycine has no chi angle because it has no side chain. Okay, so the chi angles are the rotatable bonds available in the side chain of the protein. Okay, 
uh, tyrosine being big because of the phenyl ring, it has only two. One at the CH2 position, where it is attached to the C alpha, and at the OH position, okay, which is free to rotate. That, 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 that are two chi angles. What? Tyrosine uh, phenyl alignment has only one kind. <coughs> Just a minute. Okay. So this information is being fed up in this, and there are eight blocks or eight operations that happen until you come up with, with this structure. Okay. Now let's say we initially we come up what is called as a residue gas. Okay, like uh, in like you know in your when your uh, the theory of how the universe expanded was because of a small gas and it exploded and so initially on origin we keep everything at you know at origin that is the the uh, what is the uh, invariant uh, invariant point attention so after that is attained you place one after the other and you make changes to all the chi angles possible here okay. And then you make connections. Now, in this case, when you're holding the protein, okay, what we allow is the violation of the backbone geometry. Okay, you know that the NC, uh, NXCO, that is the backbone amide, is always should be a trans. Okay, but in this case, to make this particular folding accessible at a faster rate, these these loss functions will not look at the backbone geometry. That will be corrected later on. Okay, once we have placed every amino acid in a put particular folded way, now we make backbone changes, backbone connections, and using amber force field, which is which has exactly which exactly has all the parameters to set your backbone correction uh, in a very nice um, real life protein structures. We do a refinement here and that is all you get correction. Now once you have made the correction, the green is the prediction of on the next and blue Oh, sorry, the gray is a true structure. Now you see, you find out the distance. Now you do a frame alignment point error. Now all of this can be rotated, translated in every way. That is taken care of by rotational and the transition point of reference. Okay. For a particular set of a true structure, okay, you rotate both the true structure and the predictive structure and calculate these errors of where the X should be and where the X is. This error is then fed back. Okay. This error is fed back here. It goes to all of it, refines that, and you get to ask your structure of course. Once there are no more corrections to be done, then you presume that you have more most accurate structure as you could in in best of the information you have. Okay. So now there were many components. Now 44 learning blocks in Eva blocker, which is taking from the structure and distance matrices and then structure blocker. And there was so many information that was fed in. To understand how the neural networks are functioning, they did what was called as an ablation test. Ablation test means you take out one component at a time and see how the prediction is going on. Okay? When you have everything, the original, the predictions are good. Okay? The GDT is in positive, the good structure. Baseline, you go, you don't do any of the learning. Okay, you're still okay. So zero, the predictions may be quite random. Okay, then you don't use the distance matrix, the histogram. Then your predictions start to fall. You don't use an MSA data, the predictions fall. You don't use this module. Okay, the predictions are bad. So everything that falls to the left of this line are bad. And if you are not using any recycling and IPA together, the structures are worse. So this is for cache data set. The cache domains are like you know what the compete what the competition house gives you to, to predict. And this is the overall entire protein data bank. See the errors are quite almost you know they are in sync with each other. So they, using this, they kind of understand what each block of of programs are doing. Okay. So in the cache evaluation, what happened was you had two set of you know, many structure proteins, but there are two kinds of Problem. One is template based modeling, which is considered easy because if, you, if there is an identifiable template to this given sequence, which you can identify from the set of data banks or Uniprot data bank, and you can make predictions. For that problem, which is considered easy, you see, this is one cycle of Evo blocker, okay? And you see the structure, which was template based, uh, uh, about it's an LMPR protein, it's a uh, membrane based protein, within one cycle. 
it will just require one cycle to get convergence. Okay. On the other hand, ORF8 SARS of the SARS CoV protein, which we did not know of the structure, only sequence was known. Okay. This was done in pre modeling. There is no template and it's considered a really hard problem. Okay. In hard problem, it took with at least three cycles or four cycles until it could get the best possible GDP. That is about 75 to 80. Okay. Now, this is how difficult. Now, in this case, alpha fold could reach this threshold of 60, which was set by the previous one. Okay. Uh, for pre modeling, it's still lower at 50% and less. But for template based modeling, you can see here it has reached the barrier of 90%, which was not even achieved by any of the algorithms so far. Okay. What this T1024 T is actually the codes given for the particular protein. D1 and D2 are domains of the same protein. Domain 1 from N terminal, domain 2 is C terminal. Okay. They have to hold, they have to predict it separately as well as together. And this was the most challenging problem because uh, SCOVI was one year old and proteins are also one year old. Whereas ORX8 proteins, that's open read, open reading frame 8. If you if you look at there are eight, there are 16 reading frames. Out of it, 8 was the one which was very challenging because there's no homologous protein that was known to be known for any other organism. So that was considered a very, very challenging problem, which also which was uh, which uh, you know, even alpha fold had a very big problem initially, but then they required more than four cycles iterations and then they came up with a very nice structure which was good experimentally. Okay. So here is all of these caps. So that every year, okay, this is the top this this ranking is paid on the GDS score. So if you see here, nobody had scored up until 2016 above 40, 50 percent. Alpha fold in 2000, alpha fold one came up and broke that barrier and crossed the 40 percent mark, it came to 60 percent and in 2020 the paper we are discussing went up to 85 plus structure. And if you see one of the structures has a GDT of 90 and 93. And if you see the green part is experimentally solved and the blue part is alpha fold structure. It's not even the backbone similarities. Alpha fold was actually able to say that if if you know if like if a uh, zinc is to be placed, a zinc finger proteins have a special either you have uh, histidine residues or a, a pair of histidine and cysteine residues or all cysteine residues. So that the side chains have to be very specific, okay? And taking the sequence data, we never know where the zinc is to be placed because sequence does not give us that data. And yet, alpha fold was able to predict the residues with the RMS of 0.8, okay? Point, oh, sorry, 0.59 is how much it is different from that. That eight Armstrongs around the zinc residues will place correctly. This means you can just take an alpha fold prediction and place the zinc binding site at the zinc, uh, uh, you know, binding site. And you will see that all side chains will be correctly coordinating with things. Like Even for a very large amino acid pro uh, 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 protein of you know, 2000 and more, the RMSD was 2.4, which is significant, okay, because people in this class would, would, uh, would, you know, would have fed of more than three and four Armstrongs, okay. Now, to give in perspective about how these RMSD changes are different, now remember if you take the width of the carbon atom. It is 1.4 Armstrong. Okay. So if you see an RMSG of 1.4 Armstrong means you cannot differentiate between the carbon place here and here. In this case, this RMSG means you can actually differentiate that. Okay. It is the less than the width of the carbon atom. That is that accurate to give put things in perspective. Okay. So that is all about alpha fold, and I have two questions that we can discuss and debate on. Does has the protein pro folding problem really solved? And um, now that we have alpha fold is able to fold or not get the tertiary structures right, what is next is the protein that works as multimeric units. Can alpha fold predict how, given a sequence, whether the protein will be a dimer, monomer, tetramer, or so on and so forth? So thank you for your attention, and we can take questions and debate. Thank you, Elvis, sir, for such an informative and detailed presentation. If anyone has any questions, they can unmute and ask or put them in the chat box.
So I had a question actually, but I'm not really sure if it is, I mean, the right way of uh, putting it. Okay. So, uh, like, how sure are we that, uh, like, molecules in a specific defined environment uh, exist in low energy state? Um, I don't really think I am sure your question. Are you there? Are you... Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I understood your question. Can you either say that again or? Uh, so we do energy minimization, right? Yes. So, uh, and we obtain like the least energy uh, confirmation. Yes. So like, why do we exactly do it? Okay, first of all, uh, um, the thing is, uh, when we do, uh, now, when you're taking structures from protein data bank, okay, let's say it's an X-ray crystal structure, which is highly, uh, which was, uh, which had a resolution, the solving resolution was uh, about 1.8. That means it was very accurate enough to differentiate, uh, differentiate all the atoms. But what happens is, when we take it into a molecular modeling package, what we do is we add hydrogen to it, first of all. Okay, and since the, the X-ray resolution power was not to the power that can resolve that the hydrogens are also placed, the software does what is called as valency filling. Okay, and uh, some you know if, if it's in the vicinity of an hydrogen hydrogen bond forming area, then it has some criteria to place the hydrogen. Otherwise, it has no very clear cut way of placing a hydrogen. So when you do all these things. There are some things that change which are not naturally seen, okay, and which which lead to some kind of some kind of you know uh, distortion in the structure, which not which are not very good. So we do an energy minimization so that everything is nicely set. And energy minimization is not something what is very perfect because these are also coming from models, right? These are also coming from what we learn yeah. about. So we don't know exactly if if that is the right way of doing it. So. There are like various amounts of post fields, various energy algorithms. What we only try to understand is we are not violating any rules of chemistry. That okay, for instance, in a pro in case of protein, we know that if if, if, if a residue is in a part of an alpha helix or a beta sheet or anything, the Ramachandran has already said that the chi the the the, the chi angle that is the n c alpha and okay and the psi angle that is the c alpha or uh, sorry yes, c and the c alpha. Okay, are fixed. There is a particular distribution if you are a part of it. Whether you follow in this distribution, then you are good. Because if you remember that Ramachandran plot is the four quadrant, and you know in the upper uh, upper left quadrant you have an alpha helix sheet, and then and there are random coils. Okay, and these are all to place your second you know side chains correctly. Because if you violate this backbone geometry, then your side chains would clash into something. Okay, but yes, we. Definitely do not know for sure whether this energy is the lowest energy, which I also said in my you know, very beginning slide that when we go down to the minimum, we never know that this is global minimum or a local, one of the local yeah. minimum. We, are. Yeah. Yeah. we never know this information. We only pray and hope that we are chemically right. Okay. And okay. And the second thing is we do not take computational answers in absolute sense. We take them in relative sense with respect to what was we do kind of a benchmark, right? When we when we learned about docking, we learned that a benchmark docking set, what parameters are good, okay? What parameters will produce a docking force which will be as, you know, very similar to what is experimentally seen or um, a, a folding structure which is what is actually seen, okay? This is all relative. We're not talking about any aspect. Right. So it the same set of uh, energy functions, the same set of rules, then you know that you're, you're kind of cancelling out errors, fortunately, and you're getting that the relatively these errors do make sense. And we pray that our experiments also listen to what our simulations do. Yeah, but we don't absolutely, we never, never really are sure unless you do it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for answering. Sir. There was somebody else who's trying to ask something.
if anyone wants to answer or discuss these questions, we can go ahead. Okay, I think there are no questions. What shall we do? Sir, if nobody has any question, we can call it a day and I request you all to switch on your videos so that we could take a nice screenshot. Okay. So is it okay if we share the recording with um, like we if we keep open to all yeah yeah for sure if you if you felt that was